Okay, this is part two of our SOL review. So today we're gonna to be reviewing genetics. So remember, everything we write down on our facts to know, you need to be writing on your paper. So let's go ahead and get started, Ms. Cook. All right, so the very first thing that we uh, want you guys to be able to do is to compare and contrast some key concepts when we talk about DNA and RNA. And one of the things that is actually very important is talking about structural differences and also how they're similar. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and look at nucleotide structure. Um, Ms. Hines, can you remind us what are the three things that make up a nucleotide? So there's three parts to the nucleotide. There is the nitrogen base, which is the part that we abbreviate a lot using letters, and we're gonna talk more about that later on in the chart. There's also the sugar, okay? And again, we're gonna talk about that in just a sec. And then lastly, there is the phosphate. All right. So let's see how all of these fit together. It kind of looks like a puzzle. So okay. um, if you guys remember this, we always say that the phosphates are always circular. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my phosphate in, and I'm going to go ahead and label it a P. Mm -hmm. Our sugars always look sort of like a house. Like a candy house. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and draw in my pentagon, and I'm going to label that my sugar. And then sticking out on the side over here is going to be my... Nitrogen base. Nitrogen base. And believe it or not, when we compare DNA and RNA, they're both made up of? A phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. So I'm going to go ahead and draw an arrow because I know it's true for both of them. But what's different is when we look a little bit more closely at some of these parts. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at the sugar in DNA versus RNA. Okay. And what is the sugar, what is the sugar called in DNA? So in DNA, the sugar is called deoxy ribose sugar. And that's where DNA gets its name, deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay. And RNA is ribose sugar. So just take off the deoxy part. All right. And again, if you look at the first letter on each of the abbreviations, mm -hmm. they're named after their sugars. Um, structure. Is DNA fat or skinny? DNA is a fat molecule. That's why it's stuck in the nucleus all the time. It can't get out. And that's because it is double-stranded. It has two sides to it. But what about RNA? RNA is the skinny cousin of DNA, right? So right. I'm going to go ahead and say that this guy is skinny. And that's important because RNA is, has to be on the move all the right. time. DNA is kind of stuck where it's stuck. So DNA is skinny, or I'm sorry, RNA is skinny, and it is single-stranded. And just so people aren't confused by that, I'm going to go ahead and draw in my RNA right here. Yeah. Um, that means that RNA only has one side of, of this mm -hmm. nucleotide structure or one chain of these things, and DNA has two chains. Yeah. All right, what are our nitrogen bases for DNA? Okay, so our letters inside of DNA are A, T, C, and G. And remember, we had a, a couple different ways to remember that. You can think apple trees and collard greens, or apple trees and go-karts, or at go, -co. go -co, Those things all work. Right. And then what about for RNA? So in RNA, we still have an A. Mm -hmm. We still have a C. We still have a G. The one that changes is instead of a T, there is a U, which stands for uracil. Okay. So this is my uracil. And then what is our base pairing rule with this guy? So instead of A going with T now, A is going to have to go with U. And C is going to go with G. All right. All right, now let's look at the location. So because DNA is so fat, it's... Mm -hmm stuck where it's created. So right. where's DNA always found? Always in the nucleus, always in that control center. Okay. And RNA, this is tricky because yeah, it moves. It does move around. So you're going to find it in the nucleus. So you it could. starts in the nucleus. That's and where it, it's created. Right. And then it goes out to the cytoplasm. And a lot of times we'll find it at the ribosome because it helps with making proteins. And so that's another really common place to find it hanging out. All right, so we'll put all that information down so that we have it to study. Number two. Number two. So these are some processes that involve DNA and RNA that we need to know about. So the first process we need to know about is called DNA replication. And that's when the cell makes exact copies of DNA. Now, why would the cell ever want to make a copy of its DNA? Well, a cell needs to make copies of its DNA if it has to make more cells for the body or for okay. the organism because we need, we need to make sure that all of our cells have the exact same DNA. When they don't, we know that troubles can happen, um, mutations, if you will, and those mutations can lead to really devastating types of diseases um, like cancer. Right. And just so we remember, this term replication is an important one. Mm -hmm. Replication means to make a copy. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's look. I think Ms. Hines just gave us the answer yeah. for part A. Cells must copy their DNA before they can divide for growth and repair. All right. And these are the two reasons we do it. All right, now let's look at the next one, protein synthesis. We just left some blank lines here because there are lots of different ways that we can talk about protein synthesis, but let's start with just a really simple definition. Okay. This word synthesis, what does it mean? Um, so when you synthesize something, it means you put it together, or you create it, or you make it. Okay, so, so we're, we're going to make. If we put those two things together, we get that protein synthesis is to make proteins. All right, so I'll go ahead and write that down, to make proteins. And what players are involved in this? There's a bunch. So we've got our DNA. That's the handbook, right? That has our instructions for making a protein. Okay. There is something called mRNA, which is the messenger RNA. mRNA is the copy of the instructions because, remember, DNA is stuck in the nucleus, but mm -hmm. we build our protein at the ribosome. So we need some way to get the instructions from the nucleus to the ribosome. And then there's also something called tRNA, which stands for transfer RNA. And tRNA has this special ability to, to translate from the language of RNA and DNA into the language of proteins. Um, and so what tRNA's job is, is it helps bring the amino acids to the ribosome in order to build our proteins, like the trucks that bring the building materials. And just so we all know, all of these things have to do their job somewhere. So messenger RNA and tRNA are all going to do their job at the ribosome. So the ribosome is kind of like the factory. So right. it's the site where our proteins are made. All right, so that was a lot of stuff just for yeah. protein synthesis. And um, in your review packet, you'll see some more activities for you to kind of make sense of all this stuff. But it is important for you to know, just in general, synthesis means to make. So we're making proteins. And you need to know that we need the instructions to do it. We need a way to deliver the instructions. Mm -hmm. And we need the building blocks of the ingredients to actually make the proteins. And then right. we need the kitchen or the place where mm -hmm. we actually put all this stuff together, which right. are our ribosomes. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's look at number four. Number four is all about genetic vocabulary because right. genetics really has a language all its own. So we want to fill those terms in. And I would say that this would be a great thing to make flashcards for. Definitely. All right. So let's start with a gene. Okay. Um, so a gene is simply a piece of DNA that codes for a protein that has the instructions for how to build a protein in your body. So for example, the gene for eye color might code for a protein that makes your eyes brown or that makes them blue. Okay. Um, what about the word allele? Okay. Allele is a version of a gene. So for most genes, there are two possible versions you could have or alleles. And we abbreviate alleles using letters. So we'll use big B's, little B's, big D's, little D's to represent these different versions. So they could be capital or they can be lowercase. Right. And I hope that this is all coming back to you guys because we spend a lot of yeah, time working did. with alleles. Now genotype sounds like the word gene. So what is a genotype? The genotype is the genetic makeup of a trait. So it's your genes. Okay. Or what alleles you have. Of a trait. Or it could just be your, can we say letter combinations? Yeah. Because that's what it looks like when you do word problems. And we are going to be doing them today. So letter combinations. Now phenotype sounds like another word. It's got that PH and it sounds like? Physical. Right. And that's because a phenotype is the physical appearance of a trait. It's what you actually see when you look at someone. So a good way to think about phenotype and genotype is if you can look at somebody and you can see it, it's their phenotype. But if you can't see it, it's their? Genotype. Right. So, uh, you know, here's an example. We have Ms. Hines right here. You guys can see her in the video. If I asked you what are some examples of phenotypes that she has that you can see, you can tell me her hair color, her eye color, her skin tone. But if I asked you about her genotype, you'd probably be stuck because you'd have to do some more investigative yeah. um, practices in order to figure that in. out. All right, what about the word homozygous? Let's break it down. Okay, so that prefix homo means same. And so someone who is homozygous has two of the same letters or alleles for a gene. All right. That are the same. Right. Can you give me an example? So an example would be if I had big B, big B. Or if I had little B, little B. 
because in both cases, the size of the letter, the allele that I have, is the same. Okay, and let's look at this other word, heterozygous. It looks similar, but not quite the same. Right, so that prefix hetero means different. And so someone who is heterozygous has two different alleles or different size letters. So for example, big B, little b. Okay, so there's my example. So dominant allele. So the dominant allele is the stronger version of a gene. And because it's stronger, because it is large and in charge, we use a capital or large letter to represent the dominant allele. And what's important to know about the dominant allele is that if you have just one dominant allele, it's going to show up in your phenotype. All right. So these guys are in charge. Right. How about recessive? So the recessive alleles is the, the weaker version of a gene. And so because it's weaker, not as strong, we use a lowercase letter. And you're only going to see the recessive trait if you have two of the recessive allele. Because if you have just one big letter, it's going to win. All right. So can only see if you if have two you copies. Have two. All right, so number five says, sometimes genetics follow different rules. So do you want to tell us about that? All right, so this is uh, referred to as something called complex, which makes sense because it's not following the same yeah. rules, complex inheritance. And there's only two forms of complex inheritance that we've talked about mm -hmm. this year, and so we need to fill in those two down here. So for the first one, it says blank inheritance, so it's a type of complex inheritance, occurs when both phenotypes are expressed. So we see both. And I will tell you a hint. The example that we used in class was something like a checkered chicken, mm -hmm. right, or a roan cow. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and write checkered chicken for my example. And a checkered chicken is simply a chicken that has both white and black feathers. So we're mm -hmm. seeing both phenotypes equally expressed. So in this case, what would that be called? It's called co-dominance. And so if you can remember cow and checkered chicken, both which start with C and both are great examples of co-dominance, you can remember that it starts with a C. And for our next one, it's an inheritance pattern that occurs when heterozygous, heterozygous means two different two letters. Different. Mm -hmm. So um, different letters. We'll write that down because that's important. When heterozygous genotypes cause a third phenotype that is intermediate or in between the other two phenotypes. Because so far, whenever we've talked about simple genetics, you either have blue eyes or brown eyes. You right. either have blonde hair or dark hair. You're either right. tall or short. But we know that most inheritance patterns aren't that simple, and we sometimes see a mixture in right. between. So what is this one called? This is called incomplete dominance because neither one really wins. They get, they get mixed together. And a great example of this is in flowers, um, specifically snapdragons. So if you take a red snapdragon and cross it with a white, neither color wins. Instead, you get an, an intermediate. You get pink flowers. Yeah, so another way of thinking about it is that neither one is stronger than the other. Right. And so they just kind of have to blend together. Number six. Number six is really important. Lots of people have issues with this. So we want to make sure that we understand what's going on when we compare and contrast cellular division. First, there's only two types. Right. Okay, so what we need to figure out is what is it used for? So what is mitosis used for? Um, a lot of things. So one thing it's used for is to help you grow. So as you go from a baby to a full adult, you have to grow and make more cells, and you're going to make those cells using mitosis. What else is it used for? We can also use it to repair. So if you've ever had a bruise or a paper mm -hmm. cut, the reason why you no longer have that is because the cells that were damaged were replaced by the other cells around it. Right. And then the third one is something that we don't do. Right. We don't do, only bacteria do this. It's called asexual reproduction. So another way of saying it, it's the process of making a clone. And we don't clone ourselves. Yeah. All of our babies are genetically <laughs> unique. Um, what's meiosis used for? Meiosis is used to make gametes, which are sex cells. And so this is a part of sexual reproduction, which we do do. All right. So we use it for sex cells. So we could also say it's used for sexual reproduction, right? which makes it distinctly different from this guy. Right. All right, so in mitosis, how many times does the cell divide? The cell divides just one time. All right. And in meiosis? Twice. It's going to divide two times. All right, and just so you guys remember, we talked about this process called PMAT. So this does PMAT just once. Mm -hmm. Meiosis does PMAT two times. 
two times. You can do your dance moves, right? That's right. All right, and then does it make cells that are haploid or diploid? So I guess we need to talk about what those words mean. Right, so again, these words sound like what they are. So haploid sounds like half. These are cells that only have half the normal amount of DNA. They only have one set. Um, diploid sounds like double. And that's because these cells have double the DNA. They have two sets of DNA. And I'm just writing chromosomes, but it means the same thing. All right, so in mitosis, are we making haploid cells or diploid cells? We're making diploid cells. All right, so diploid. And can diploid be abbreviated? It can. We abbreviate diploid using 2N. All right, and what about meiosis? So meiosis is just the opposite. It's going to make cells that are haploid or just N. And this should make sense, right? We don't want our sex cells to have all the DNA. We only want them to have half because eventually they're going to combine with another sex cell. Yeah, and we have to maintain our magic number, which is 46. Right. Does it make identical or unique cells when we talk about mitosis? So a great way to remember this is I always think of the T in mitosis as standing for twin which is identical. And that's because mitosis always makes cells that are exactly the same. They're all identical to each other. And then what's another word that we can use for identical? The same. The same or clones. Or clone. So all of that is the same. All right, and then how about meiosis? Meiosis makes cells that are all unique. And that's because a very special process happens in meiosis called crossing over, which is where the chromosomes get together and the DNA gets mixed up between them and we get these new combinations. All right, and then where does it happen in people? So mitosis happens in your body cells, which are also called your... Somatic. Right. And then you want to tell us about meiosis? Sure. Meiosis only happens in sex cells. Um, and specifically, they happen in your gonads. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a funny word. Yeah. So what are gonads in women? So the gonads in women are the ovaries. And in guys, it's the testes. All right. For number seven, we're um, asking you about the structure that basically looks like a genetic family tree that traces the inheritance of something through a family. Mm -hmm. So what is that thing called? It's called a pedigree. And what it's tracing is the inheritance of a particular trait through a family. And oftentimes it's, it's diseases. We use these to look at, at the, how diseases run through families. Okay, and so the weird thing though about this particular genetic family tree is that there are no faces on no. it. We use shapes to represent males and females. Right. So let's talk about females first that do not have the trait. What shape do we use for them? So a female is a circle on a pedigree and then one that does not have the trait will just be empty. Okay, and a female that has the trait? Will be a circle that is shaped shaded in. So the shading means I have the trait. Okay. And then what about males? So males are a square and again an empty square is going to be a male without the trait and a filled in square would be a male with the trait. Okay. And then now let's look at our very last concept for genetics. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time looking at pictures of chromosomes neatly yeah. laid out based on size. What was that picture called? It's called a karyotype. All right, so a karyotype is basically just all the chromosomes in a cell laid out. Right. And a normal karyotype should have? 46 chromosomes. To be normal, that's an important number, right? So the last pair of chromosomes are called the? Sex chromosomes. And those are really important because they can tell us something about the karyotype that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at a male karyotype, what should we see in that last pair? They should have the chromosomes X, Y. You can remember Y makes you a guy. If you've got Y, you're a guy. Now the females, on the other hand, they don't have a Y. Instead, they have the sex chromosomes X, X. All right. Make sure that your notes are completely filled in. If you have any questions, um, please ask, and you're going to use your notes to fill in um, the rest of the day sheet. Good luck, guys.